I cannot believe the words that are about to come out of my mouth, but Justin Trudeau has enacted the Emergencies Act in Canada. Christia Freeland has expanded on that, stating they are freezing the bank accounts of those involved with the Freedom Convoy protest, and even today, further stating they are going to be investigating those who simply donated to the Go, Send, Go and GoFundMe and even in Bitcoin to these protesters, investigating these private individuals with the RCMP. Of course, this has caused for mass uproar in Canada of people wondering, are their assets safe? In fact, the search for bank run Canada has just gone through the roof on Google. Banks are down. There is so much uncertainty in the air about what is going on and a total failure from our politicians to answer questions directly, whether they be legitimate questions from those that are a part of the protest or not a part of the protest saying, hey, when are federal mandates going to end? What is our exit plan? Is there an exit plan? Is it based on the amount of people in hospitals? Is it based on, you know, case counts? What What is the plan here? There's questions still about whose accounts are at risk and whose aren't. What the emergency act, the extent of what it's going to be used for. Are there going to be police and army going into these protests? Whether or not you support the truckers or not, it is right and just for our politicians to answer these questions with clarity and they are not doing that so today i have brought marie oaks on she is from the westphalian times writer for them she's been reporting on a lot of the mandate protests on the ground we're going to talk about a lot of the misinformation that has been put out there a lot of the flip-flopping from the canadian government and generally just what the hell is going on in my country right now this is outrageous where are the armed men who come in to take the protesters away where are they this kind of behavior is never tolerating in Boracua. You shout like that, they, they put you in jail right away. No trial, no, no nothing. Journalists, we have a special jail for journalists. You're stealing, right to jail. You're playing music too loud, right to jail, right away. You're driving too fast, jail. Slow, jail. You're charging too high prices for uh, sweaters, glasses. You right to jail. You undercook fish, believe it or not, jail. You overcook chicken, also jail. Undercook, overcook. You make an appointment with a dentist and you don't show up, believe it or not, jail, right away. We have the best patients in the world. Hello, Marie. It is so good to have you here. Thank you for joining me on the channel. And how are you going today? I'm doing as well as anyone could, but seeing as you're in Canada, I cannot complain. Yes, actively shitting myself, actively going to the ATMs, trying to get cash out, like a ton of other people, apparently. And we'll get into that. There's a genuine fear of a bank run happening even beyond all the crazy protest emergency powers. But uh, speaking of, of, let's jump straight into the emergency powers that Trudeau has brought into place. What's up with that? You've been reporting on this, uh, covering it with the Westphalian Times and even on the ground with some of the protests. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are with many other people on this issue. I'm very confused as why this is being invoked. Has it really met the high caliber of needing this Emergencies Act? Uh, where is the justification? So far, the Trudeau government has been very clear that they don't really want to be transparent as to what exactly is the reasoning behind invoking this act. And even in Parliament today, it was a lot of no answers. I mean, I'm not really surprised. This is something Trudeau's government does often, and Trudeau does it in a very smug sort of way in Parliament time and time again. But when we're reaching something like the Emergencies Act, this is a time when you would hope a leader would actually do their due diligence and actually, you know, have their ducks in order, have their facts in place. But alas, this is what Canada has become. Yeah, I've seen some people stating, like, for the people opposed to freezing assets of blockaders in Canada, what is the alternative? Send in the military, see what violence happens, allow them to remain indefinitely. What is the alternative? And some of the replies to tweets like this have been great. He invoked this act literally before even talking to the protesters. He just called them all racists and then gave himself more power. Like, how about any of the steps that are taken in other protests, like communicating? with the protesters, seeing what their needs and wants are. If they're conducting illegal behavior, have arrests, have court orders made to remove them. Like, or, or even if you want to freeze people's bank accounts because you genuinely feel the money is going to illegal activity, use the proper methods. Use the proper methods to do that. 
And I think that's kind of the issue we're coming across here is this protest has been largely a peaceful one. Of course, you have some people who maybe are mentally unwell and engaging in activities that are not lawful, but that by and large does not represent the entire protest by any means at all. And it's very far and few in between that we've seen these examples that the media really likes to drive forward in the agenda, but it it's falling on deaf ears at this point because people can see on the ground that this is like a very much peaceful, you know, I would even call it a protest. It's like a peaceful party. It's not, it's like rowdy. Yes. But nothing more than just being rowdy and loud music where, where even the police chief, the former police chief said, like, we do not have the means to really do anything because not many laws are necessarily being broken. So right now, the only way to get rid of this protest is really through political means, not necessarily policing means, because, you know, the police can only go as far as the law allows them. And right now they're going as far as the law allows them. And I don't know if there's much appetite in the police force to go further than what the law allows them to. They've been scrutinized. This is a city where even the chair of the police board said that they changed to a progressive policing system. And now it seems like people are very unhappy with their progressive policing system because it's not, quote unquote, this 1950s policing type of situation that it that the dean's lady said last night so it's kind of like push and pull do you want to be a progressive or do you want to like be more authoritative and go in this direction that you have for so long been against that it's kind of this conundrum we're facing with a lot of these progressive people wanting not a progressive police system in action but they want it in like uh materials they want to just see it as this but not actually in means yeah i think i hate using this word because i feel it is so often misused but the word grifter i feel like this moment is really this distinguishing the grifter progressives from the actual progressives who believe in what they say like we're seeing uh members of the squad like ian omar who has come out instead said about journalists doxing people donating to the truckers I fail to see why any journalist felt the need to report on a shop owner making such an insignificant donation rather than to get them harassed. It is unconscionable and journalists need to do better. That was amazing. And you've even had people like Vosh, who's like very progressive left wing, come out and say the Emergency Act and freezing protesters' assets is wrong. And this is a consistent take from them. If you don't see left wingers making those points, they're grifters. Straight up, they're they're they don't believe in what they're saying. It's purely for political reasons. Exactly. We're seeing so many people on this progressive left really mouthing points that you would traditionally think coming from like hard social conservatives. But now it seems more like the hard social conservatives are more progressive than the people who call themselves progressive. I mean, through my time and just reporting in Canada on the ground from protests, I've seen this move you know, from conservatives and right wing people towards a more middle ground type of more liberal left stance when it comes to policing, you know, coming to civil liberties, coming to police crackdown. And I think that's something to cheer on, to be honest. And it it should be more of a uniting time between, you know, such division we're seeing between both of the political sides, the ideological sides. But really, we're seeing quite the opposite happened where it's sort of like that whole idea that the parties shifted. Well, is it happening again? (laughs) Because it's really weird seeing all these really hard, you know, people who call themselves socialists who, you know, talk about community policing, really wanting police to crack down super hard. I was on this Twitter space the other night that a bunch of journalists, it was actually on Valentine's Day, a bunch of these Canadian journalists put this you know, why do people hate us type of Twitter space together. And the way they were talking was exactly why people aren't happy with what they're doing. Just like Ilhan Omar is saying that they're doing these things, but they refuse to like see the other side because you would think in a Twitter space like that, they would have people on to discuss 
you know, people's grievances with the way they report. No, nope, mm-hmm. that's not what happened. They basically just went on rants about how it's really hard. This is from Justin Ling saying it's really hard to be objective in their coverage of this because of how like terrible the people on the ground are. Another person was comparing Trump to Hitler saying the way they both um, treat media is very similar. No pushback at all on that front. And then the journalists, like these are some of the most prominent Canadian journalists in Canada saying, just discussing their bias stems from their white privilege. And if you think the bias in your reporting is because you're white privilege, well, that's the reason people don't really like the way you report because you've totally missed the mark on where your bias is actually stemming from. Yeah, well, actually, you know what? I do think it stems a bit from maybe not white privilege, but their privilege in general. They're in a position where they are not the people being affected by these mandates. They're journalists. They work from home. They sit in their cushy couch getting their, you know, their latte and complaining all day on Twitter about people who are actually the working class in Canada, pretending they support them in a very, you know, superficial manner. But then when it actually comes down to supporting them, if it makes them look bad in front of their other wealthy, you know, top class friends, then they'll just call them names, call them uneducated, call them stupid, and completely disappear from supporting the working class. Um, I mean, that's, that's literally the exact points I was hearing in this other Twitter space of Ottawa citizens, which a lot of them didn't even live in the downtown core. They like lived outside of Ottawa. So I was kind of confused why they were talking as if they lived right where the protests were happening, but they were saying things about, you know, whenever they see pickup trucks, now they have to like be nervous that more convoys are coming or nervous of their neighbors who have pickup trucks. They were saying like, these people are like uneducated, just like you said, like they don't know how to speak well. And it was just like, are you kidding? Like, this is why you guys don't understand why these people are protesting. You haven't been impact the way that they have been. I mean, it's ludicrous that people think, I mean, it's even just ludicrous when you see the counter protests happening, they're all wearing masks outside. It's, you can just tell what exactly is going on in their head, where exactly they think Canada is when the polling surprisingly is showing these people are not representative of how Canadians are feeling more Quebecers than any other place in Canada is done with the measures. That was the most shocking, you know, statistics I was seeing is coming out of Quebec, but Quebec also had the worst measures. So I think a lot of these people who are super angry are just not really understanding exactly where Canadians are feeling because it happened like that. People switched and that's sort of how it is in Canada. People will only take so much until they won't anymore. And that's the thing that kind of makes Canada a little different, especially this is something I've noticed in Quebec, like people are for something until they're just not. And then they're the absolute opposite. So it's pretty curious because I also have seen some reports that a lot of this funding for the convoy was coming from more liberal NDP writings, you know, compared to the conservative writings. So oh, yeah, that's, that's I think something, people have, yeah, that's something I people want to, have to wrap their head. People have to wrap their head around that. This is not necessarily a conservative movement. This is just like a nonpartisan movement. I have friends of mine that are progressive influencers in Canada that will never say a word about the mandates because obviously they've got their progressive jobs and everything that couldn't be more against them, couldn't be more against them. And they know other people in their circles. And this is the terrifying thing that I don't think many progressives and left wingers realize when you make it so that your opinions are not voluntary, you make it so that they're based on fear, so that there's always this thin veneer of threat you hold these opinions or you'll lose your job you'll lose social credit with us you'll you know not be able to be in these same art spheres you'll get canceled online people only hold those opinions at an extreme surface level and the moment the tide changes they're like oh thank god let's just destroy this get rid of this all like the the progressive fog over canada is very thin and very temperamental they don't have people's hearts and minds they have their fear and that's all and you you don't ever want to be just feared as a leader of a cultural movement you want to at least be loved and feared or you know (laughs) there has to be a bit more there because when you're just feared people will get rid of you the first chance they get 
Um, now, before we we could go into this forever, I mean, so many people confusing saying the majority of Canada is, is against the truckers. Ah, 60 percent are against the mandates, actually. So many people confusing the vaccine statistics with actual support for mandates. But I, I want to get to the actual financial stuff happening here. And because uh, I think that's what everyone is kind of bringing up the next, last few days. What they're really afraid of is their personal lives being destroyed by the political views they have. So I'm going to quickly play this video by Christia Freeland that came out this morning, actually. So you're confirming that accounts have been frozen, both personal and corporate, but you're not releasing the information. And the actual follow up is um, I'm just wondering whether the bank accounts will be targeted of individuals who donated to the Give, Send, Go and the GoFundMe campaigns. Are they considered designated people under the Emergencies Act, meaning that their credit cards could be cut and financial services are targeting them as well? Okay, so the names of both individuals and entities as well as crypto wallets have been shared by the RCMP with financial institutions and accounts have been frozen and more accounts will be frozen. Uh, Crowdfunding platforms and payment service providers have started the registration process with FinTrack. Uh, In terms of the specifics on whose accounts are being frozen, uh, you now have the regulations. The financial service providers have those regulations as well. And they, working with law enforcement, will be making the operational decisions. So we knew they were freezing accounts of people that were organizing this protest. That was something we knew from a few days ago. But now it is sounding like they are actually going to. uh, And she was not clear with her answer here at all with the reporter. It was very up in the air, wishy-washy, but it's sounding like they are collecting information on the people who donated to the Give, Send, Go and the GoFundMe to put it to the RCMP to see if they're going to freeze their bank accounts with no due process. Well, that's what's so scary about this whole issue is because in the Charter of Rights, there is something about search and seizure. And this is sort of like going against the Charter of Rights and the whole Emergency Act is not supposed to be in contradiction with the charter. Your charter rights are still supposed to be, you know, in possession, still intact. That's why, you know, I, I think this was some of the reasons why the Emergency Act replaced the War Measures Act was because there were these concerns within Parliament and within the political circles of, you know, these type of ramifications that could happen. And right now they're just doing that. It still hasn't been voted upon in Parliament as of recording this right now. We're still not sure. Like, will this go forward? It probably will because the NDP is going to vote with the Liberals. But it's it's just overall, we're not sure who's going to get hit. My friend, he's a lawyer in Ottawa, and he said he's fielding calls all day from people who donated and who are very concerned and people who donated maybe 15 bucks and they're getting calls from journalists seeking comment. I mean, why does it matter? Like I've seen on Twitter, these type of um, accounts, like posting people's names and saying, oh, this and this conservative staffer gave this much money. And I'm just like, who cares? I don't care who gave to BLM. I don't care who gave to whatever donation they wanted to give to. Why do we care what people spend their money on? If it at the end of the day is not going towards like, you know, trafficking, those sort of things. Why why do we really care what other people are spending their money on? It's their decision and what they want to spend it on. And, you know, the other thing that I find so troubling is the Trudeau government just keeps calling this illegal, illegal protests, illegal, unlawful protests. I'm like, how exactly are they illegal? I really don't understand because what we see is bouncy castles, dancing, food, free food, you know, police and people having good relationships. And we just see the media so mad that they're having good interactions. And I'm like, my mind is blown. Don't we want good interactions at every single protest between protesters and the authorities? That does not make sense. Well, what's crazy too, is like the majority of people who donated to that, especially the GoFundMe, there was not any illegal activity when that fundraiser was booming they were literally just driving across the country letting their thoughts be known at that point 
And yet we're seeing their information now being handed over to governments to potentially give them access to consider freezing their accounts. Right now in Canada, the search for bank run has just boomed in Canada right now. And there's a genuine fear that this is happening, especially considering yesterday a ton of banks and ATMs just went offline. You had RBC, BMO, Scotiabank, TD, the Canadian Imperial Bank. They were all hit with unexplainable outages on Wednesday evening when all of these people were looking up bank run and a ton of people were considering taking taking assets out of the bank because of these emergency powers being invoked. Um, one person, Will Chamberlain here from Human Events, he said, if a bank can seize your assets with no due process, why would you keep your money in the bank? Now, we don't know if there is a direct correlation. I would be surprised if there wasn't some correlation. But what, what are you thinking of that? You just said you had your friend get fielding calls about people wondering what they should do about their assets in the bank. That's the thing that's so like bad about this situation. There's so much uncertainty and uncertainty drives fear and fear drives, you know, reactions that maybe are not necessarily, you know, logical in the moment right now. I don't think most, at least this is what my lawyer friend said. Most Canadians are okay. Their assets are not going to be affected. Even if you gave $15, it's very unlikely, you know, they're going after bigger fish right now. They're going after their political enemies. And that really seems to be the reason that this government has invoked the emergency act. It seems like they're trying to use this for political reasons, not exactly for the reasons they're stating, which is the health and safety of Canadians and businesses and have you not. So that's what's concerning is there are these consequences of pulling a stunt like this. And I do think this is a stunt because I don't think that he has the wherewithal to even invoke something for this situation. It's not of national, it's not a national crisis. It, it vaguely fits the second um, type of for the public order. It, it vaguely could fit that could possibly be argued, but that's the issue. We don't want to possibly be arguing this works in one situation. It has to be clear cut that it works in this situation. This sets a really bad precedent for, you know, moving forward in Canada. Say we had, you know, on the opposite, we had those, you know, train blockades again. Would progressives be so happy with a conservative government invoking the emergency act for that? Yeah. I'm very doubtful of that. Yeah. And you're seeing like a wild international reaction right now. You've got you know, the president of El Salvador, leader of El Salvador, saying Canada now has zero credibility when talking about democracy, human rights, these kind of things. You're seeing just mocking on the world stage memes of pictures of Trudeau with dictators. Bro, you seeing this? And they call us dictators. Hold up. I got a line, bro, like with Kim Jong-un. And everyone is just mocking Canada as this authoritarian hellhole right now. Do you think that Trudeau, Christia Freeland, and these politicians in power are starting to feel that pressure on a world scale? You've got mandates being dropped in most countries, mask mandates, uh, you know, even vaccine mandates being dropped in a lot of countries. And do you think they're feeling the heat? Or do you think it's going to be more about trying to appear like they didn't capitulate to protesters and trying to hold out? Well, if we're not seeing it on the international scale, we're definitely seeing it within the party. There's been detractors within the party. There was um, MP Joel Lightbound, who had that really explosive press conference. I think it was last week now where it was like an hour long, really just outlaying the, uh, you know, divisive rhetoric that's been you know, in place since the election and that the election, he really saw a ramping up because political points. I've seen on Radio Canada an interview with what seemed to be a very kind grand grandmother who demonstrated for her grandkids. She looked and sounded nothing like a white supremacist. I mean, I don't really know right now. They're playing some hands that really don't seem strategic. And I think it's this idea of this unwillingness of them to come to the table that we have seen for the last seven years of Trudeau's, you know, leadership in Canada. 
this is not new. This is just like on a much higher scale. It's similar to when, you know, veterans were calling him out for, you know, not giving them proper funding and him not really caring, saying, oh, the people kind. That was the thing where he, the guy was expressing his grievances and he changes the subject. And that's sort of how Justin Trudeau is. It's, we saw it yesterday as well in parliament when he's saying to a conservative Jewish MP that she stands with the swastika. It's he doesn't understand the things he says. And I think it's really if it doesn't bite him in the butt right now, it is going to soon. I I don't see him being the leader of the Liberal Party in the next election. I don't think people within his caucus have the appetite to deal with what he is standing for right now. And he might be on the chopping block at some point, especially if this emergency act leads to, you know, some violent pictures coming out of Ottawa that really put Canada more on blast right now. We're not seeing, you know, a really big push, but who knows what we'll see in the next week. Oh, it's unbelievably divisive language to be using as a leader. And yeah, you're right. It's amazing that there's been like, what, four liberal MPs that have come out and said, no, like, this is not the path forward. You can't paint such a large group of our country as racists, misogynists, horrible people, just because they disagree with you on this one issue that most of the world are starting to turn to disagree with you on. That's the reality. I know there's a lot of people huffing copium out there, pretending the world isn't opening up. And I don't know why, like, this is a good thing. It's a good thing that we are getting out of this. Whether your opinion is pro lockdown or uh, totally against all lockdown, the fact that a lot of countries are getting to a point where their health experts, their leaders are saying, listen, we've done everything we can and now it's time to open up. We've surpassed the largest waves of COVID. Great. We should all be celebrating. If you're not celebrating, there's some weird political psychosis going on in your brain. And I think that's what's happening with a lot of these, you know, liberal candidates and news media individuals. They have mixed up being against COVID infection and being against conservatives. They think that, you know, you have well, to that's support the fundamental- mask mandates to the end of the world, even if they're not necessary. Otherwise, you're a conservative. It, it's not but about that's also- it's like psychosis. that's the thing that while I've been covering, you know, the protests in Canada, when I was on the ground in Montreal, I would time and time again see the media, you know, calling these demonstrators all right or right wing. And they couldn't be further from that. Almost no one in the crowds that I would cover and I cover for like six, seven months. People were not right wing. These were either people who don't vote or were complete hippies. And then you'd see a couple PPC voters, but not the majority of them were that. These are a majority of people who probably don't like politics, don't engage in politics. And then other people who are probably more like NDP, Quebec Solidaire type of voters who just are artists and you know their livelihoods have been uprooted it's montreal for god's sake where you know most people are pretty progressive just that's a baseline there and you would just see people playing guitar dancing like you know hippie type of girls with flowers in their hair these were very much hippie people and the media likes to slander these people as right wing and it's like I know you guys aren't there. I went to every single protest. I would see maybe you guys there for five minutes. So, but we are seeing some step up to the plate. And I know one girl who stepped up to the plate and Trudeau didn't like her questions. So now she's not getting any more questions at the press gallery anymore. And that's sort of seeming like how it's going to happen that anyone who pushes back, they're not going to get a question anymore. You might never hear their name come up in question period again from a journalist from maybe global or yeah. I politics, et cetera. So well, there was a global uh, news producer who actually gave a speech at the last mandate protest in Vancouver. And she said, I knew I was going to lose my job the second I let my opinions be known. And that's what happened. They fired her. And the minute that I started to, you know, I kept my mouth shut, right? For like, this is a media for most of 2020, because if you ever spoke up, you got into trouble, right? But, uh, as soon as I started to speak up, that's when I got suspended. 
So people know, like, this is how bad it is. People know they will get fired from their media jobs if they have any, any of the wrong opinions. You can't tell me our press are free to tell us what is actually happening when that is what is going on internally. You can't convince me of that as if they're going to be able to report the news to us as if. Well, it's especially with this condo, I think for so many people in the press, the mask has been lifted. Some that seemingly were more unbiased than others are showing that they are no different. I mean, we're seeing with the Mercedes from the global, she's really a mask off, you know, Mackenzie Gray from CTV, you know, when you see these journalists just running around Ottawa being hall monitors, being like, oh my God, they're getting gas and where are the police, where are the police? It's like, it, and the way these tweets are, you know, structured, it's not like an information, oh, gas is coming in, blah, blah, blah. It's more of like, how dare gas come in? How dare there be hot tubs? How dare there be bouncy castles? It's a, you know, moral condemnation type of tweeting. And it's just incredible to see how they don't, understand that they are there to do a job not to advocate for either side and i think these lines in journalism and totality has been blurred that's personally why i don't call myself a journalist because i i don't want to like hurt the name of journalism i'm just a reporter i'm just someone who writes i i don't want to put myself behind that because then you get attacked for saying you're this you're that and it's i think journalism needs like a I mean, whole journalism is a you know now. redone you're a journalist <laughs> <laughs> you journo it's actually a slur because now they've because of how bad the they've been so bad can you imagine can you imagine going to journalism school and like spending years and thousands of dollars getting an education and and then spending your time dismantling the life of someone who donated five dollars to a gofundme while protecting the massive corporate elites I just, it, it's humiliating. It's embarrassing. Your life is an embarrassment if that's what you're doing with your time. I'm so, no, I'm not sorry. You know, it is. Uh, you sent me a video. Uh, you, you just tweeted this out. When questioned about what evidence there is for the claim that foreign extremist financing is behind the Freedom Convoy, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau does not answer. So there has been this claim that the majority of the financing for the Freedom Convoy is this dark foreign money that's all shady and it's extremists. Is there, should I play this clip or should I just ask, is there any of that? Is there any truth to that? Well, we can play the clip, but also in the tweet under, I I say that. Um, so conservative MP Lloyd said that last week, Deputy Director of the Intelligence for FinTrack, Barry McKillop, I, I'm so bad at pronouncing names, stated that there is no evidence that the funding behind the Freedom Convoy is tied to ideological motivated extremism, and there has been no spike in suspicious transactions. I think we should show the video just to show the type of you know person Justin Trudeau really is when he is pushed back on things that are, you know, he's saying or that's happening in the country. All right, let's check this out. Speaker, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Public Safety, and the Minister for Emergency Preparedness have repeatedly stated that there is evidence of foreign extremist financing behind this convoy. Last week at Public Safety Committee, Deputy Director of Intelligence for FinTrack, Barry McKillop, stated that there is no evidence that this funding in Ottawa is tied to ideologically motivated extremism. Under further questioning, he stated that there has been no spike in suspicious transactions. Under what basis is this government freezing the bank accounts of Canadians in violation of Section 8 of the Charter against unreasonable search and seizure? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I think it is going to be extremely important that uh, in this House over the coming days there will be uh, Im uh, a important and robust debate on many such issues. But I can highlight once again, Mr. Speaker, that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms continues to apply. Uh, the Emergencies Act is uh, subject to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the measures that we've brought forward are proportional, measured and responsible uh, and uh, designed to get Canadians their lives back, their communities back and restore their freedoms. What, what a non-answer. I hate this. I hate it. I'm sure. But hey, why are you violating, you know, the laws of this country? 
I'm sure we're going to have a robust debate about this. Well, no, this is the debate. And you're supposed to show up and say something when someone asks you a question in a debate. You don't get to just say the debate is going to happen. You are actively in it and you have no answers. Oh, man. Well, that's the thing is they keep trying to push these conversations because they want to be able to, and you know, use the emergency um, act right now without any pushback from any of the parties which we know will probably go through anyway, but still they want to be able to use it and they want to use it to the point where they can justify their use of it. That's why they're kind of pushing back, you know, this debate, this to be had because they're, they're hoping that if there's more Quebec provincial police in Ottawa, there's more Ontario provincial police in Ottawa, that something will happen between protesters and police. This is my understanding of the situation where then they can justify the use because right now I think they're in a bad place where they invoke something that they may not justifiably been able to invoke. And we're even seeing, I can't remember the group's name. I sent it to you. Um, but the, I think it's the center for what's their name. It's the, um, Canadian civil liberties association. They're even now speaking up about it there. It seems like, cause it, the press conference hasn't been had yet, but they say they're going to have a press conference to, you know, talk about. Um, yeah. So just announced a news government. conference taking place at 4 p.m. by the Canadian Civil Liberties Association relitigation. So the Canadian Civil Liberties Association will announce its intention to pursue public litigation or litigation of significant public interest. So this is regarding the Emergencies Act, I guess. It's most likely because yeah. they made an announcement the other day about how they haven't the government has not reached the threshold that they need to reach in order to invoke this. So it, it wouldn't really make sense for them to be having a press conference really about anything else, because this is the main thing in the public interest right now in Canada. Yeah. Oh, did you see? Sorry, this is like so random. But did you see Doug Ford just like snap the other night? No. Oh, wait. He like so Doug Ford has gone pretty hard on the mandates. And like two nights ago, he just came out and was like, you know what? This is over. No one wants this anymore. We're all sick of it. Just screw this. (laughs) It was incredible. I'm just going to quickly play the video for everyone. You know, you you can go to you can go to Costco, you can go to Walmart, Um, you can go shopping. You know, you don't know if the person has a shot beside you or not, but we also know that it doesn't matter if you have one shot or 10 shots, you can catch COVID. See, the prime minister has triple shots, and I I know hundreds of people with three shots that caught COVID. We just have to be careful. We've got to always make sure we wash our hands and and move forward. But Colin, we can't stay in this position forever. We got to learn to live with this and get on with our lives. I bet if I asked every single person, in this room do you want these damn masks or do you want them off they want them off they want to get back to normal they want to be able to go for dinner with their families and there's every single person including myself knows people that are unvaccinated you know sure there's there's the rebel rousers and then there's just hard-working people that just don't believe in it and and that's their choice this is about again a democracy and freedoms and liberties and I, I hate as a government telling anyone what to do we just got to get moving forward and and get out of this and protect the jobs you know we're, I think a lot of people call them probably yourself too everyone's done with us like we are done with it let's let's start moving on and cautiously and you know we, we've, we've followed the rules all of us like 90 percent of us for for over two years the world's done with it so let's just move forward This is all the liberals had to do, all. Recognize that people have legitimate concerns. Recognize the world is done with this. Recognize it's been two years of this and people are sick of it, even if they don't want to leave the restrictions, even if they want to keep them in for some reason. All they've had to do is recognize there are real people that aren't racist, misogynists, horrible, evil terrorists that have legitimate concerns. It's the whole country. And perhaps give some sort of timeline or reason for why they're continuing these mandates. Give some sort of timeline for when they're going to end, whether it be, you know, the numbers of capacity that hospitals have to be at. This when when hospitals are at this capacity, then we will remove restrictions. This date, this time, this reason. But there's just nothing. So if people are confused and wondering if this is just politics and games being played with their head, I I don't blame them. I don't blame them because there's been no pathway laid out. 
Well, even with, I have to push back a little, even with what he's saying right now, this is politics. This is games. He's only saying this True. after. <laughs> At least he's, he's recognizing only saying this. that people have real concerns, though. <laughs> yeah, he's only saying this after the polls. And he's only saying this after he supported Trudeau invoking the Emergencies Act. Uh, most mm. minister, uh, premiers did not. Quebec didn't. Scott Moe didn't. Of uh, Saskatchewan. Jason Kennedy of Alberta didn't. So... I mean, forgive me if I'm wrong. I, he's playing the politics right now, and he has been the whole time. I mean, I think the only one who really hasn't, the only one who the minute these convoys even started, I, I think it was even before the convoy hit Ottawa, Scott Moe of Saskatchewan, he announced that they're going to put a roadmap. They're going to remove things. And, you know, he actually did it. It took... Ontario, Quebec, all of them to be very last in BC, as you know, is basically like still not saying really anything. Yeah. I'll, so this is something I'm getting a bit of backlash from is like when Ehan has come out, uh, Vosh, all of these, you know, progressives that have just kind of been quiet about the suppression of free speech, civil liberties for a while. I'm like, thank God. And people are saying, Lauren, they're just speaking up now, now that they're seeing the tides turn. Don't don't forgive them. Don't celebrate them. But I'm at the point where I'm like, I don't care. I don't want to be a hipster. I don't want to be like I said it first or other people said it first. I'm just happy. I just want this insanity to end. I don't care if Doug Ford is being a snake and, you know, he's only shifting because of the polls. You're probably completely right. I just care that there's that shift happening because I want my life, my family, people's lives to go back to normal. I don't want my assets and other people's assets being frozen by the government because of our political opinions. So I, I, I don't even care what the reason is. I don't care if they're doing it because they're the biggest snakes in parliament. Just, you know, let us have our lives back. <laughs> you, you just need to tread carefully though, because, you know, one thing that I like to hone in a lot, if anyone's read my op-eds in True North or what I tweet about, I, I really talk not necessarily about mandates, but more so these emergency orders. You know, you can get rid of all the mandates you want. If these emergency orders are not rescinded and there is nothing in place to, you know, prevent emergency orders from so easily being, mm. you know, put into place, then you really have not gone anywhere. And I think that's where this movement has largely failed, where the focus has really just been on, you know, restrictions and mandates and not necessarily the way that Canada's and many parts of the world have been governed for the last two years. I, I think people are more than anything sick of being governed by emergency orders, sick of being governed by a decree. And I think that needs to be the focus because right now, Canada at large is now being governed with the Emergency Act, which is far worse than emergency orders. I mean, we even uh, what we're seeing right now in Ontario was calling in another emergency order. I, uh, Ontario was already under one for, you know, the pandemic, but now there's another one for the protests and the border blockades. And now there's the emergency act invoked. So uh, it just seems like Canada has become just emergency ordered governed country yeah. by and large. Yeah. And it's just like zero to 100 straight to the maximum and just shut up the scent. It's, it's really, it's really upsetting. Um, and, you know, there's there's one other thing I want to touch on that I think is really quite, quite sad, but we're going to see a lot of in the coming year is people who did come out early about the dangers of this, like Maxime Bernier, uh, they'll always get the short end of the stick. That's just the truth there. It's better to be um, wrong too late than right too early, because the people who are there first saying it, they'll never get the credit. The, the leader of the Conservative Party, whether it be Pierre or um, or someone else, you know, they're going to get all the credit probably for coming out of these rules for coming out against it now that it's popular. And that's, that's just how it goes. And so to, to, to you, I'm definitely in that mood where I'm just like, just get us out of here. But to you sticking the point and saying, actually, we need people to have a good constitution throughout any given time. We can't just wait till the end. We have to support people that are consistent. We have to support people that, um, you know, have, have protected us since the start and have always held these values I, I think that's a very that's a cogent point that um, perhaps I, I'm it living it. I'm lost. living it right now. I'm living it right now. So I think for so many, it's just like just get us out of this. I've been scared. I'll be. I've been terrified to report on this. You know this. I've been sending you videos from the protests privately because I'm scared of posting them because I'm scared I'm going to have my bank account frozen. I'm scared my family is going to get hurt here. And I, 
living like that, thinking like that. I never thought I would think like that in Canada. Never. I, I've sent them to you. I've been like, I, I, I'm scared of posting these. I don't know what they're going to do to me. Yeah. Oh, and you know, like I get in- about it. Yeah, like I get information, like information that's been funneled to me from very reputable sources about things going on in Canada that I'm even too scared to post that I'm trying to get people in the legacy media to post about because if I do it, I don't, first of all, I don't have the reach or the resources that these type of people have. And, you know, I don't have a blue check mark. I'm very much, you know, an easy target for these mobs to just come after my account and get rid of me. And, you know, it's kind of scary even saying that right here because who knows who watches, you know, your channel. I I don't know what people want to do. People want to shut you up. We've seen people be banned off Twitter so much recently for no reason. And they'll say ban evasion, even though these people have never had another account and never, never have evaded a ban before where we're at this, you know, time where if you are not an authoritative source, you know, your word means nothing at all. Your, you know, everything you do, all your work doesn't matter. And it is getting to the point where it's pretty scary that only a few voices matter in general. It's just with the big tech censorship and especially in Canada where most of the media that really informs the masses is government, you know, at least partly funded. Would they be able to you know, operate if they didn't get this government funding? Does this impact their reporting? Obviously it does. You want a good relationship with the government so they don't cut your funding. And that's sort of how it works at every job. And so many people are so delusional to that point that they're like, oh no, they can report how they want. They'll never cut their, it's like if at your job, if you get into like a scrimmage with your boss are you really sure you're going to get that raise or you're not going to get fired? Like, come on. We've all dealt with that. Yeah. It's all these things that can't quite be tracked and it's all being done at a level that um, doesn't make the government look explicitly like authoritarians. I, I think that they almost invoked the emergency act so they didn't have to get these clips of them sending the army in dragging kids away from these protests, you know, but luckily people are seeing through it. They're like, no, no. You're, you're still well, an authoritarian. The thing is, so many people, I don't even think Canadians understand what's been invoked because life looks normal. And through a lot of the pandemic, I think a lot of people also didn't really understand that they were living under emergency orders till it was much, much later. And I think that's what a lot of Canadians don't understand right now because you'll have Rosemary Barton from the CBC hitting at the New York times for saying that the um, emergency act, you know, hinders civil liberties. She says, Oh no, that's not true. So New York times deletes it. Well, that's not correct. That what they wrote was true. It does. If people cannot go to specific locations, that is a hindering of civil liberties. I'm fairly so certain when you're- we put the Japanese in internment camps under the emergency acts. Like I'll, I'll have Not to the go emergency, but the war, war measures, measures act. war measures. Okay. Yeah. But like these, these levels where it's like, you can, you can give the government a surprising amount of authority to violate people's civil liberties when they feel there's an emergency war, whatever it might be when they declare these things. And, and like, yeah, in the war measures act, they're putting Japanese Canadian government was putting Japanese people in internment camps. And now we've got an emergency act that allows now for we have people's bank accounts for their politics. It's wild. But we also have journalists who refuse to, you know, be advocates for civil liberties. I, I think a lot of people think journalists are never supposed to be, you know, advocacy groups for anything. Well, that's not true necessarily. They're supposed to be advocates for free press, freedom of speech and civil liberties, because that falls under the umbrella of free press and freedom of speech. And that's a really cornerstone of journalism is to have these type of um, civil liberties upheld. So they're supposed to hold you know, governments accountable when they are in breach of people's civil liberties. But right now they're giving them cover saying, no, no civil liberties could be breached on the emergency act. That's certainly not the case. It's certainly possible. And that's like um, that conservative MP said, search, you know, unreasonable search and seizure. That's exactly what's happening. I think you are absolutely correct on all points there. Uh, That's why I'm so glad I could have you here. I know you don't call yourself a journalist, a reporter, 
<laughs> now that Turno is a slur, but I'm so glad I could have you here to talk about this issue and actually converse about where our government are breaching people's civil, civil liberties, where they have gone too far. And at the very least, we have this platform for some time, hopefully longer than we expect, to uh, discuss that. So, Marie, where can people find you and follow the very important work you're doing, whether it be on the U.S., Canadian or global front? Um, so I'm at the Marie Oaks pretty much everywhere. I'm at Twitter. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Telegram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Getter. I always kind of forget all the places I am, but basically almost everywhere I am. So I'm at the Marie Oaks. So it's pretty easy to find me given that. And you'll usually see her on the the other Lauren's YouTube, Lauren Chen, but this Lauren has stolen you for today. And it was a lovely conversation. Hopefully we'll do this again. <laughs> Thank you for having me on, Lauren. All right. We'll see you all next time.